Okay, good morning, guys. Uh, I am going to run you through lab two for our animal phys class. Unfortunately, I, we can't be on campus together, right? So I'm gonna actually do the lab in, in my um, basement, if you will. I have everything I need here to, as far as experimental design to do the lab. Um, lab two, we are testing osmolarity and tonicity and our understanding of osmolarity versus ten uh, ten tonicity, sorry. And we're gonna be using red blood cells as kind of our model. And I'm gonna go through the experimental design here in a second. Um, but what I want you to, to realize, and I'll walk you through here on the lab handout. So here, you know, here's the lab handout for, um, for this second lab, which we'll, I'll put on ACE. Um, basically the first part of the lab here, the first page or two describes uh, kind of partition coefficient again, molarity versus osmolarity, permeability um, of, of ions and molecules. And then part one is looking at permeable solutes or what we call penetrating solutes. So these are solutes that can cross the membrane by themselves. Um, the speed at which they do that is based on their partition coefficient like we talked about in lab. The lower the partition coefficient, the more polar they are, the slower they move across the membrane. The higher their partition coefficient, the more nonpolar they are, the faster they move across the membrane. So there are two things that really control now, whether something can move across the membrane or not, and it is their partition coefficient and their size. Partition coefficients and size of the molecules that we use in lab are found on page three, actually, of your lab handout. And the permeable solutes we will be using are methanol, acetoamide, urea, ethylene glycol, and ethanol. Each of these has their partition coefficient on page three and their size on page four of your lab handout. They're all going to start off uh, at the same concentration. And the concentration that they are are 300 milliosmoles. So they're at 300, but none of these solutes are found in the cell. So they're gonna be much higher outside the cell. They're gonna move across the membrane and water is gonna follow them. And the speed at which they hemolyze or break down red blood cells, the red blood cells being our model, will be based on how fast they can move across the membrane, which is based on partition coefficient and size. So before you, you look at the, uh, the data that I'm going to um, produce for you, um, you need to make a hypothesis based on those five um, permeable solutes, their size and, and partition coefficient, and give me um, a specific hypothesis of, of which is going to be the fastest versus the slowest um, as far as hemolysis goes. The second part of the lab is using non-permeable or non-penetrating solutes, and we're going to use three of these, um, three different molecules. Um, we're going to use sucrose, which does not pass the cell membrane of red blood cells. Sucrose or glucose do not pass the, red blood, uh, the cell membrane of red blood cells because red blood cells carry oxygen. They won't use it. They don't have any organelles. Sodium chloride and calcium chloride are other two. Now, what's interesting about using those three is that sucrose sodium chloride and calcium chloride all have different osmotic effects at the same concentration. So if I use the same concentration, the same molarity of sucrose, sodium chloride, and calcium chloride, they're going to have different osmotic effect, those solutions. Sucrose, remember, it doesn't break down into anything. So your, your molarity equals your osmolarity, right? Because it doesn't uh, break down into ions or, or, or into parts. Sodium chloride has twice the osmolarity of its concentration. So if you have a 0.5 molar solution, it's going to have a one osmolar effect. Calcium chloride breaks down into three particles, right, or three ions. Therefore, its osmolarity is going to have three times the effect, right? So if I had a 0.5 molar um, calcium chloride solution, it actually would have more of an osmotic effect of about 1.5 right, instead of 0.5, like sucrose, because it breaks down to three ions, sodium chloride breaks down to two, and uh, sucrose is only one, right? So it has three times the effect calcium chloride, sodium chloride has two times the effect of what a sucrose solution would. So you'll be able to make some hypotheses on those based on the number of ions they break down to and what concentrations we're using. We will be using three concentrations of each of these, sucrose, sodium chloride, and calcium chloride. We're gonna be using 12 millimolar, 100 millimolar and 200 millimolar, right? Remember the inside of red blood cells are 300 millimolar. So that gives you an idea of their concentration differences, the solutions versus um, versus the uh, 
the red blood cells, intracellular fluid. What I need you to realize is you got to take into account how many ions they break down to when you make your hypotheses. Now, for this, uh, for this lab write-up, the lab write-up is explained there um, on page five. We're going to be doing an intro methods, and then there's an appendix section because I want you to make a table of your results um, and then figure out um, some you know, some basic analysis, if you will, of the of your table that you make and the differences between these different types of non-penetrating and penetrating solutes. That stuff is explained um, on, on page five under the lab, and we can also talk about it live when we have one of our discussion meetings. So what I'm going to do now is kind of show you um, how I'm going to do this, how, I, how I'm going to test this lab or what the experimental, what the experimental design is. Okay, guys, so here is kind of my experimental design. So here's our lab handout and what it looks like, right? You will be able to find this on ACE. And if you look, I've been, I kind of got my, my set up here uh, like this, where I have a set of test tubes, right? Um, and I'm going to be using these to run my experiment. I'm going to be using blood as my model. So this is sheep's blood that I bought from um, Carolina Biological. And then I'm going to be using a, a, a couple different examples here. I'm not going to, you know, film the whole thing, but I'm going to, uh, all the solutes that I'm going to be using, but I'm going to use uh, sucrose and glucose. Sucrose and glucose, uh, they, they react or act the same way, um, even though sucrose is a little bigger. Both of them cannot pass the cell membrane of a red blood cell, and they don't break down into anything, right? So their osmolarity equals their molarity. And then I'm going to be using... Uh, as my positive control isoosmotic saline, which is 0.9% saline. And then as one of your permeates, I'm going to use urea, which has a very low um, partition coefficient and should lyse the red blood cells slowly. I've diluted my blood 1 to 30 um, using the isoosmotic saline. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to time how fast hemolysis takes to be completed in a um, basically two mils of blood. And so you can see I have two, two beakers here, right? Or, I'm sorry, two test tubes here with uh, two mils of diluted blood. And I'm going to show you what I mean by complete hemolysis. So what I've done here is printed out um, a sheet that has the word clear on it. And what I want you to notice is you cannot see the C, for example, when I have the uh, test tube against the paper, right? And so this means hemolysis hasn't happened yet because the blood is turbid. I can't see through the solution. Now, when hemolysis does happen and is complete, the solution will clear so that I can actually see the letters behind it, right? And I'm going to give you an example of that here in a second. So let me uh, get the experiment set up and we will start. Okay, guys, so I have added 0.5, or I'm sorry, five mils of isoosmotic saline to this test tube, which had two mils of blood in it. And as you can see, putting, putting this against the letters, that the solution is still turbid, the red blood cells are still intact, and I cannot see the letters through that solution. So this is my negative control, right? Nothing's happening um, in this, so we can't see the letters. I'm going to do a positive control using water, right? So let me get that solution ready, and you'll be able to see how fast uh, hemolysis occurs when you're using something like pure water. All right, so let's do pure water now so that you can see these next to each other, all right? So I'm gonna add the pure water here so that you can see what hemolysis looks like. So if you look closely now, you can see the letters through there, right? So you can see all the letters, or you can see two of the letters, CL, right, really easily. You cannot see that in the 0.9% saline. So you got 
negative control on the left and positive control on the right. So this is what it's going to look like when we add solutions that cause hemolysis. It's going to be clear. And this is what um, it will look like when there is no hemolysis on the left. No hemolysis on the left, hemolysis on the right. Pretty neat, right? And that's how we're going to do it. Then we're going to time how long it takes. And that's uh, uh, what we're going to utilize to kind of do a discussion on our understanding of tonicity and osmolarity in a hands-on experiment. So let's try some of these solutions and see what happens. All right, so we're going to test our first solution here. We are going to do our permeables first. We're going to do urea first. All right, and we're going to add urea to this in time. How long it takes for it to clear through hemolysis? So I'm going to add it here once I get my stopwatch ready, and we'll see how fast it takes to clear. Your mark, it's set, let's go. And it's about clear now. Okay, so that took about 12 seconds. That's how long it took for urea to clear that. So uh, that was one of our permeables. And so remember, it started off at 300 milliosmoles, which is isoosmotic. It measures isoosmotic, right, to our intracellular fluid of red blood cells. But since urea is permeable, it crossed the membrane because it's not found in red blood cells very readily, and water followed it in, and it took about 12 seconds for that to happen. Next, we will do our sucrose solutions. We have a 12 millimolar and a 100 millimolar, and we'll see how fast it takes for those to cause hemolysis. Now we are going to do the 100 millimolar glucose. We're going to do that one next and see how long it takes. And it took 26 seconds, as you can see. And it's going to be 12 millimolar in concentration. So that is below 300 millimolar. So it should cause hemolysis. Now we're going to see how fast um, that takes for it to happen. So let's start that right now. And it is clear right now. So again, that took about 12 seconds to happen, as you can see from the timer. Okay, so let's finish up by talking about um, the rest of the results. All right, here are our results from the experiment that I did for you guys. Obviously, I don't have individual videos of each one of these um, and the hemolysis that occurred, but you can see on top of our table here, I've written down the times. There are three of them. I did it three separate times. Um, you guys can come up and figure out how to do mean and standard deviation through Excel. Um, that is, most people know how to do that. If you don't, ask around until you figure out how to get means and standard deviations. And then you can make a histogram that shows the means of each of these and their standard deviation. Standard deviation shouldn't be too bad based on the numbers if you look at them, but you can see which ones uh, hemolyse the fastest. I will tell you that urea here does not make sense. Obviously, it has a really low partition coefficient, and it should be really, really slow in how fast it hemolyses red blood cells, but obviously it does it relatively quickly. Um, and there's a reason for that. I need you to think about urea channels and red blood cells. Maybe look that up on uh, Google or Google that. Find some information on urea and how it's transported through red blood cells and if red blood cells have urea, urea transporters because that is what they would need to have, right? Because urea doesn't pass across the membrane very well. 
Um, if you look at uh, the others here, down here with our non-permeates, you can see we have three different concentrations, 12 millimolar, 100 millimolar, and 200 millimolar. And where you see no in the boxes means that there was no hemolysis. So you can say, see in the 200 millimolars, only the glucose caused hemolysis. The other two did not. And that should make sense based on the number of ions they break down. And with the 100 millimolar, notice that calcium chloride didn't, which should make sense because it has three ions, which technically measures 300 milliosmoles, right? Which is isoosmotic and isotonic to the cell. So I'm not going to tell you the results of each of these numbers. I want you to analyze your figure or figures. You can make two of them if you want, one for permeates, one for non-permeates for me um, in your appendix. So this information is going to go in the appendix of your lab write-up. Now I'm going to pull the lab up really quickly. Here's the lab. And I'm going to go up here again to how to write this lab report. So where you guys are writing an intro and a methods and an appendix section for this lab, you want to label each section with its heading. Um, I will put on the line a PDF of what belongs in an intro methods and appendix. And also on ACE, I will put a cheat sheet, if you will, that tells you what I am going to be grading. It's basically the rubric for the intro and the methods. The appendix section is going to be like a mini results discussion section together. Um, and that will be done at the end. So make sure you read this little student hand, handbook for writing in biology, which I'll put online um, here this afternoon on ACE, along with that cheat sheet so that you know what it belongs in each of these sections. Also, I provided how to cite for this um, particular um, article. Usually your citations are going to appear in the introduction and in the discussion. So here you might have some in this particular write-up, definitely have at least three sources in your introduction um, that are primary journal articles. And also you probably are going to want to have some sources, citations in your appendix. And so those are cited this way, as you can see on the bottom of this first paragraph, um, within the actual body of the, of the text. And then these are the citations that belong in your um, in your reference summary at the end. So this last paragraph here talks a little bit about uh, how you write the methods and in intro, and then the, uh, to make sure you check out that checklist on ACE uh, that I will put up online um, on ACE this afternoon. So I think that's about all I have for the actual video for um, the write-up uh, for Lab 2. Um, let me know if you have any questions on what was done and what these times mean. If it's a little confusing to you, you can ask during these, the live uh, discussion next week. 